Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video in the One Minute Apologists Unapologetic series, this one responding to the problem of evil. It's always fun to listen to the problem of evil apologetics, they usually just break down into original sin and God's plan is beyond our understanding, but they have to dress those obviously inadequate answers up to make them seem better than they are, and watching that exercise is almost always amusing. But before we jump into that, I'd just like to announce that I've started a secondary channel where I am going to be focusing my live streams in the future. It's called The Watering Hole, and the link will be down below. I'll still be streaming here for now, but I am going to be separating my streams into more digestible chunks and uploading them over there, and I do plan on moving my actual streams there eventually too, in order to keep my channel more focused. So go ahead and subscribe to that one and watch a handful of videos that are already over there while you're there. With that out of the way, let's go! Uh, Bobby, there is no shortage of truly awful things that happen in our world. I'm reminded of a friend that uh, lost an unborn or preborn child to a genetic condition, um, the horrors of COVID, just the tragedy of COVID right now, uh, the tornadoes that recently ripped through the Midwest, like, several hundred miles, completely wiped cities off the map. Those are events that tend to be categorized as natural evil and would be explained away with God's mysterious plan. Now, why an all-powerful being who can do literally anything would need to cause so much pain and suffering seemingly indiscriminately in order to achieve his goals is never quite explained. I should probably caveat this whole video with the fact that the problem of evil is not one of the more robust arguments against a god, because it carries with it certain assumptions about God's personality and character that don't necessarily hold true. Namely, that he wants what is best for everybody, and that he is capable of delivering what is best for everybody. And I think we can discard the idea that God wants what is best for everybody if we're looking at the Christian picture of God, because Christians are unwilling to give up the properties of omniscience and omnipotence, which means that God knows what is best and is capable of making it happen. And yet, hell exists in this worldview, where God sends people to torture them for eternity. I don't think anyone would disagree that going to hell would not be best for anybody, and yet the Bible says that most people will go to hell. Ergo, God does not do what is best for most people. Bobby, from your perspective, where is God in the midst of all of this suffering? It's a question that many people do have, and you're discussing and distinguishing between two types yeah. of suffering and evil, and it would be moral evil and natural evil. And thus begins the dance of trying to blame humans for the fact that God made humans imperfectly, all while minimizing the fact that natural evil is a thing that exists, is obviously bad, cannot be explained away with original sin, and should be completely within God's ability to control. I. Th think as it relates to the world that we live in when we experience any of these types of evils, uh, depending upon, uh, you know, one's relationship to God or one's mental mindset with God, they might feel as if God has completely left them in the tragedy, and yeah. they will use that as justification to deny the existence of God altogether. Well, Personally, I denied the existence of God, so to speak, long before my own personal tragedy, and the problem of evil had nothing to do with it. It was biblical inconsistencies and contradictions that did me in, followed by actually reading the Bible and seeing what kind of an immoral monster the character of God is. Which I guess is kind of an aspect of the problem of evil. If the Bible God exists, he's not a good God, he is an evil God, and that's not the kind of God that I would want to worship. Anyway, I concluded that the description of God that we get from the pulpit is not in agreement with the description of God that we get from the Bible, and the simplest solution to how that could be the case is that neither God exists. But yeah, some people do stop believing because God failed to protect them. Pastors will constantly be preaching about how God will protect you if you just trust in him. So it would seem that his failing in that endeavor is a pretty clear sign that he doesn't exist in the first place. Either that, or he's just not trustworthy. I think one of the dangers that ends up happening in this, Tim, is first off, you have two major contentions, I think, that the atheist can have against uh, Christianity that is hard to answer at times, mm -hmm. and that would be the problem of suffering and evil and then the problem of divine hiddenness. Right. Divine hiddenness is that one where God seems to have become less and less active as our ability to scrutinize his activities improves. 
But more than that, the Bible actually supports the idea of divine hiddenness. In Matthew 11, Jesus thanks God for hiding things from the wise and understanding, and goes on to say that no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. This kind of flies directly in the face of Romans 1.20, which makes the claim that everyone knows that God exists, but that some choose to deny it. I mean, I guess you could reconcile it by saying that Jesus chooses to reveal the Father to everyone, but then that makes the verse in Matthew more than a little bit pointless, and it would only serve to cause confusion in that case. Well, it's sometimes when you're experiencing the problem of suffering and evil that it seems like God yes. is hidden, <laughs> right, right? right? No. To me, it seemed that God was hidden when I spent time in desperate prayer asking him to reveal himself to me and got no answer. I wasn't going through any particular evil or suffering or anything like that at the time, aside from the suffering caused by losing the faith that had been such a large part of my life up until then. And I think we do a disservice at times to our churches uh, when we try to give this perfect analogical relationship between God and maybe parents. Mm. For example, as parents, we know that when our kids suffer and they struggle, uh, we do whatever we can to intervene. Yeah. And the problem of suffering and the dark night of the soul that we often go through is when we're experiencing some of these horrendous evils, it seems as if God doesn't intervene. Mm. It seems as if he doesn't remove some of the obstacles. And the usual apologetic for that is to take the analogy in the direction of things that our kids might consider to be suffering, but which parents allow to happen for what they know will be a later benefit. Like not saying yes every time the kid asks to buy candy or toys, or taking them for a vaccine, or letting them figure out how to do something difficult but achievable on their own. In my view, the problem with that is that usually the things that the child considers suffering but the parent knows will be good in the long run, the child is just mentally completely incapable of even understanding the trade-off there, because their brains just are not developed to the point where they do understand that. So you could say that God understands the good that will come of the suffering and we are just incapable of even comprehending it, but in this view, God designed us. He could have designed us with the capability of comprehending such things, but he chose not to. So just keep in mind any time that you're tempted to resort to us not being able to comprehend something about God's great plan or nature, that God chose to make us incapable of comprehending these things. And that doesn't sound like the kind of choice that a good God would make. It seems as if he doesn't show up, and that's because we've end up expecting God to operate in relationship with us, just like maybe our parents would operate mm. with us. And we have to realize that while the Bible does use some analogical language of God as like a father, yeah. if we if we impose on God the way that we would act when we see someone that suffer, and then we go, why God did you not intervene? Mm. That can set us up to be disillusionment, and uh, that can set us up for disillusionment and cause us to really struggle. Yeah. Okay, so so in what scenario is it okay to allow someone to suffer if you have the ability to prevent it? And I'm not talking suffering that will cause personal growth here. I'm talking about stuff like, for instance, a non-believer dying a painful death. Not only do they suffer as they die, they are then sent to hell to suffer for an eternity. God could have prevented both of those if he wanted to, but he did not. So what scenario would make that okay? And talk to me a little bit about, talk to the audience and myself a little bit about where the, the cross kind of fits into some of that, where where the crucifixion fits into this idea of suffering and how that can maybe give comfort to people that are experiencing, whether it's natural or moral evil, but they're just kind of in the midst of that suffering. What, what role does the cross play in that? No role. I hate to keep bringing this up, but it is relevant. According to Christian theology, my wife is currently in hell, suffering, and cannot ever be redeemed. So the cross won't fix that. And if I want to avoid sharing that fate, I have to accept that there is an afterlife where I could potentially see my wife again, but give up the only chance that I would have by going to the other destination. It is very much a lose-lose scenario for anyone who has a loved one who died without being a Christian. I think what Christianity even helps us to see is it's a worldview that fits within the explanations that we give for the problem of mm. suffering, evil, and divine hiddenness. Yeah. Maybe I'm misunderstanding what he's saying here, but he seems to have just said that Christianity is a worldview that fits within the explanations that Christian apologists give for things, which seems like a well-duh kind of moment. But also, as obvious as that may seem, I think it's actually a little bit wrong. 
because often the problems with Christianity stem from what a Christian worldview is supposed to include. There wouldn't be a problem of evil if the Christian worldview didn't assume an all-powerful, all-loving God. In fact, you see that drama played out in different figures, like Job um, or Habakkuk, um, experiencing tremendous suffering. Yeah. Well, the story of Job is the story of God essentially torturing a guy to win a bet with Satan, who, it's worth pointing out, was not Satan in the modern sense of the word, but instead was just a Satan, with Satan being a title rather than a proper noun, just to indicate the member of God's court who was meant to challenge God's policies, to put them to the test in order to ensure that they are the best policies. In the case of Job, he is challenging God's policy of rewarding those who are loyal while punishing those who are disloyal, claiming that Job is only loyal because of the rewards, not because of real loyalty. So God messes up Job's life to prove that the loyalty was not purely transactional in nature. And it's a bit ambiguous, but generally apologists will point to Job 1.12 to say that it was Satan testing Job, not God. God is merely permitting it, not causing it. But in Job 1.16, it says that the fire of God is what killed the sheep and the servants, not the fire of Satan. Now, you could argue that this is a servant reporting it and the servant was just mistaken about the source of the fire, but in Job 2.3, it just flat out says that Satan incited God to destroy Job without reason. Not that Satan destroyed Job with God's permission, that Satan goaded God into destroying Job himself. Then in verse 5, he continues to goad God into harming Job some more. And yes, it does go on to say that it was Satan inflicting these particular harms, but at best, we can say that this is a team effort between Satan and God, and at least some of the harm God admitted to doing himself. And your inclusion of Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, or however you say that, is a bit baffling, because that whole book is basically Habakkuk asking, Hey God, why do you allow this evil suffering and violence? And God responding with, you think things are bad now, just wait until I let the Babylonians conquer you. The best interpretation for this story is that God actively causes evil as a form of punishment, which is definitely something that some Christians still believe today, but it's one of those super harmful ideas which results in people blaming the victims of disease, natural disaster, and other so-called natural evils for things that aren't actually their fault. Also wondering, God, where are you? Well, Jesus is on a cross in the same way. Uh, you know, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yeah. That's actually a good question. If Jesus is himself God, then how is it even possible for God to forsake him? And I could go on a whole rant here about how one of the early Christian sects believed that Jesus was the man who was inhabited by a spirit from the God that was the Christ. And when Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? That was the moment when the Christ spirit abandoned Jesus to his fate, with some versions of the story even having the Christ spirit hovering over the cross and laughing while the human Jesus died in agony. But that's off topic here, as I don't think there are any modern Christians who actually believe that. It's just a fascinating glimpse into early Christianity. Uh, he's quoting Psalm 22, but nevertheless, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, and he willingly went to the cross, mm. and he suffered on our behalf. Okay, he suffered on our behalf. Fine. But what that implies here is that we are supposed to be suffering. Thing is, usually the problem of evil is presented with regards to, you know, suffering that we can actually see happening now, not hypothetical suffering in the afterlife. So in this context... That would mean that Jesus should have taken away our suffering in this world, so that Christians don't suffer. But that is most definitely not the case. But then also, suffering after death is a thing in the Christian worldview. And my question at this point becomes, what is the point of that? We hurt God's feelings by not worshipping him or following his laws, and so he gets back at us by torturing us for eternity? That seems petty and cruel if you ask me, even if he did provide a loophole for some people. And why is death the cutoff point for being saved? If we still have life after death, why can we not decide to accept Jesus after we die? Having death as the cutoff point just seems entirely arbitrary. And so we have this, uh, this moral exemplar in Jesus that shows us that through suffering and through agony, um, the greatest gift that was ever offered to the world 
comes through the cross. Yeah. And that's the kind of damaging worldview that leads some Christians to almost fetishize suffering, which in its least harmful iteration leads to movies like The Passion of the Christ being made, and in its more harmful iterations leads to quote unquote charities that actively work against the best interests of those that they are supposed to be helping because they see suffering as a blessing and so redirect resources away from the areas that would alleviate the suffering towards more evangelism focused areas. The most obvious and likely worst offending example of this would be Mother Teresa's Missionaries of Charity, who undoubtedly collected enough money and donations to build at least one state-of-the-art hospital in Calcutta, the city where they were based. But instead, they funneled most of the money straight to the Vatican, while denying even the most basic of medical care to the people living in the hospices run by her organization. And to the handful of you who always get mad when I would dare criticize someone as universally loved as Mother Teresa, please at least read the articles that I have linked in the description before commenting in her defense. You just might learn something. Just how would we define what is and what isn't evil in the first place? What are some different definitions that we're that are out there? Well, I don't think we want to fall into the fact that you've got this, you know, good God, right? And then you have this evil God, this dualism, so to speak. (laughs) So you don't want to fall into the thing that Christianity is? Well, I guess that's not quite accurate, because in modern Christianity, God created everything, including all the angels, which means that God created the evil God that is Satan, which he could have easily chosen not to do. So literally everything that has ever gone wrong as a result of Satan's interference is actually God's fault by proxy because God created Satan knowing that he would do all that stuff. So in Christianity, there's really only one evil deity, and it's missing a good one. And not only that, um, we want to be cautious to to not just define evil as a thing in itself. Right. Evil is not a noun, it's an adjective. Uh, If you take something good like sexuality, well, sexuality can be good in the context of marriage between a husband and wife, but you take it outside of that Mm. context and deprive it of its context, then it can be used in an evil way. Okay, but you haven't clarified how you're defining evil here. You just said that it's not a noun. What I would do is look at the consequences of an action to determine whether that action was good or bad, while also keeping in mind the intentions of the person performing those actions. In the case of sexuality, the way that you have defined good and evil uses of sexuality demonstrably have harmful consequences. Everything from married couples not being happy because they didn't learn until after marriage that they are not sexually compatible, to kids feeling like they are outcasts and there is something wrong with them, occasionally even leading to suicide. I'd say that kids killing themselves because their loved ones shun them for being attracted to the wrong people is a pretty big negative consequence. So when we measure the harm and benefit of various opinions on sexuality, the more liberal approach is beneficial with people getting more education and being accepted for who they are, while the conservative approach results in mental health issues, stress, unwanted pregnancies, and death. If the approach that leads to better outcomes in pretty much every possible scenario is the evil one, then what does evil even mean to you? Wait, I know. Evil is something that goes against God's will, so you can justify things that cause demonstrable harm by appealing to God's will. But the only thing that you have that tells you what God's will is, is a book that I guarantee you do not follow fully, and you definitely don't advocate for other rules in the book like you do for the anti-gay rules, so what this ends up being is you being a bigot, and then using the Bible as an excuse for your bigotry as you are the one picking and choosing which rules in the Bible are the ones worth making a big deal over. Right? Money can be used in a good way, right. but if you use it in a way whereby you're trying to uh, pay for prostitutes, for example, right. now you're using something in an evil way. Why is that evil? As long as everyone involved is a consenting adult, why is paying for sex wrong? Especially nowadays when safe sex is so much easier than it was in the past. Like, there's definitely bad things you can do with your money. Paying a sex worker is not one of them. Don't forget to tip your cam boys, gals, and non-binary pals. So I think that's really interesting. I think there's uh, some of the definitions that that I've heard, we talked about this before on the show, where Sam Harris kind of has this idea of evil is that which harms people, Mm -hmm. right? So anything that harms people, and then you can objectively measure that harm. And so therefore, if you can objectively measure the harm and such and such action does harm somebody, well, now you have objective 
evil. That's a fairly simplistic way of stating it, but essentially, yeah. To be more precise, to have objective morality, you need to have a shared goal with everybody, and usually harm reduction works for part of the goal, with the other end being to maximize well-being. Of course, in reality, it's hard to perfectly measure the consequences of an action, and it can be downright impossible to figure out what the consequences will be before taking an action, and so that's why I like to consider intent as well. Though to what degree intent matters will vary depending on the circumstances. But for the record, these guys are about to attack this definition of evil without having given a coherent definition themselves yet. They've just given some examples of things that they think are evil, which by this definition are actually not. You, you have something that meets that definition. How would you respond to something like that, that kind of definition? Well, I think it would be a tough uh, way to really come to any good conclusion on, you know, what's going to be the criteria. As you have failed to provide any criteria for yourself, I fail to see the relevance here. <laughs> like, for example, um, does Sam Harris uh, apply that same criteria to people he harms who are believers of different belief systems? Mm. Uh, well, uh, you know, there are people who might have been better off with their belief system, and then he goes and rattles them, and then right. they feel completely empty because of that, well, you know. And how would you go about measuring that? A decent start would be to ask the people themselves. The vast majority of atheists that I have spoken to do not feel this emptiness that you are describing. Typically, people who attend religious services do tend to be more happy overall, but importantly, it doesn't matter what religion it is, any religion will do. If it were the religion that was making them happy, you'd think only the correct religion would work to that end. It seems way more likely that it's just belonging to a community that has the effect of making people happy. So to turn this one on its head, is Sam Harris, or other atheist activists, the ones that are doing harm by pulling people out of communities that harm them in other ways? Or are the religious people who ostracize those who disagree with them doing the harm? I've never met an atheist who has cut ties with a friend or a family member because that person was still religious, but it's actually pretty rare to find an atheist who didn't have at least one family member stop speaking to them when they came out as an atheist. At least in the States. That's less common of an occurrence in countries where being non-religious is more acceptable. And fun fact, Finland has a population where 29% do not identify with any religion, and when asked, 77% of the population say that religion is unimportant in their day-to-day -day lives and yet they are consistently the happiest country in the world. So maybe stop with this whole atheists are empty inside nonsense. Uh, anything that does harm to people, what exactly does that mean? Right. And that's a valid question that we have to figure out answers to. A good place to start would be with personal preferences. I would prefer that people not steal my stuff. I would prefer not to be murdered. I would prefer not to be assaulted. Most people share these preferences, so for stuff like this where everyone agrees, we can all agree that these actions would constitute harm. For other things it can be harder to figure out, but at least we have a framework which can be applied to that endeavor. The Christian morality, on the other hand, is through divine command. Things are good or bad because God says so. Yeah, apologists like to play word games and try to get around the arbitrary nature of this moral system, but they all fail pretty miserably in my opinion. But it doesn't leave room for adapting to circumstances that are not covered by the moral code that's passed down by God, and this inflexibility is ultimately its downfall, because as a species, our moral code is evolving. Uh, and so it's really hard to come up with an objective criteria for that because what harms one individual mm -hmm. may not feel like harm to another individual. Right. Which is why the golden rule is actually wrong. Don't do unto others what you would have others do unto you. Do unto others what they want done unto them. Not everybody likes being spanked during sex, but some do. So yes, what one person considers to be harmful to them, another might consider pleasurable. If you like to be spanked but your partner does not, you should not do unto your partner what you would want them to do unto you. Are sex games fun? And so is the criteria going to look like Sam Harris? Right. I really don't know why they're focusing so hard on Sam Harris, but hey, at least it's not Dawkins this time. And that's where we have to, uh, you know, be cautious. Yeah, and I think one of the things that you're pointing out is that, like, it ends up becoming some sort of, like, democratic exercise, right? Just, like, raise your hand if this harms you, if you think this harms you. Okay, well, most people say that, that that is harmful, and we just throw out the other ones. No, not right. You're removing 
any amount of nuance that might be found in this sort of system. Most people don't want their property to be stolen, but if there are some people that do, they are free to give their property away to any random person who happens by if they want to. But the consent has to be there. Most people do not want to be killed, but in certain circumstances, euthanasia is permitted. Our legal system is designed largely around this issue of consent. Something that would be illegal were it to be done non-consensually can be permitted if it is consensual. Because preferences vary. Of course, not every law is designed this way, and there are different categories of laws for which this is more or less applicable, but it's also important to remember that legality is not necessarily the same thing as morality, but sometimes legality is based on morality. Not as often as it should be, but sometimes. So you're just saying, man, just on balance, I look at the amount of evil that's happening in our world and, and the amount of evil that has happened, and I look at the, the good God that's supposed to be out there, and it just seems like he should eliminate all of this yeah. stuff. So why do you think that kind of argument, again, we're not we're not going through the whole logical argument, why do you think that argument is so persuasive or so compelling for some people? Well, to put it simply, if God has the properties that Christians like to claim that he does, then he had the ability to make a world without the existence of evil that still maximizes personal growth and development or whatever his goals for us supposedly are, but he chose not to. Because he actively chose to make a world that would result in more suffering than is necessary, he can either not be all-powerful or all-good. Christians could solve this problem by dropping one of those two characteristics, but they usually choose not to, instead appealing to our inability to perfectly calculate how much suffering is required to meet whatever God's nebulous goal that we don't even understand is. Well, you just alluded to the logical problem of evil, okay? So if you have the logical problem of evil, and then you have the evidential problem mm -hmm. of evil. The logical problem of evil, thanks to the work of somebody like an Alvin Plantinga, um, this was an basically critics saying that, you know what? It's not logical that God and the amount of suffering that's in the world, that it can't coexist. Mm -hmm. You seem to be leaving out the part where you define the characteristics of God. But, I mean, avoiding definition seems to be the name of the game here, so that tracks. But Alving Plantinga, a great Christian philosopher, uh, really helped settle that case by showing, you know what, um, we have free will in this culture that we live in, and mm -hmm. the people have always had free will. And there is a good explanation for why um, you could have a good God and there could be evil because of people's free will. That doesn't really solve the problem, though, for a number of reasons. For starters, the Bible never actually even says that we do have free will. There are passages where that interpretation is read into it, but it never just says it. Then we have instances of God explicitly violating free will in order to make a point. It wasn't Satan hardening Pharaoh's heart. It wasn't Pharaoh's free will hardening his heart. It was God. And God also, in this worldview, set the parameters by which the universe would operate. Some things are possible, others are not. No matter how much will I have to flap my arms and fly like a bird, I cannot do that because it is just not possible. God could have designed the universe in a way that would make evil impossible, no matter what our wills are. And of course, let's not forget about heaven, where we are supposed to want to spend eternity. There's not supposed to be evil in heaven. But if free will necessarily results in evil, and nothing can be done even by an omnipotent being to stop it without violating free will, then does that mean that there is no free will in heaven? But doesn't that sort of fly in the face of why God supposedly created us in the first place, to have people who freely choose to worship him? If we lose our free will in heaven, then what was the point in giving us free will in the first place? Why not just make us without the will to do evil and skip the suffering on earth bit? And if we don't lose our free will in heaven, then how can you say that free will is the reason that evil exists, when clearly God can make a realm that includes free will but excludes evil? Also, even if I grant the free will thing, we're still left with the problem of natural evil. So even in the most generous interpretation, free will does not solve this problem. If right. they're truly free. But then um, having solved that problem, we're in the arena of philosophy of religion. Yeah. That, that's recognize that that's not a contradiction, that there yeah. would be evil and that a good God can exist. Yeah, there could be evil with a good God existing, but then when you add the all-powerful part into that God, that creates the contradiction there, because as long as God is supposed to be both good and all-powerful, then the free will solution actually introduces a lot more problems than it solves. But a more modest 
argument is the evidential or probabilistic yeah. argument um, from evil. And that is, like you said, Tim, um, it is it is less probable that God exists um, than he doesn't, given the amount of evil and suffering in the world. Mm-hmm. That's harder uh, for people to argue against. I guess, but like I said earlier, I'm not even convinced that the problem of evil, whether it be logical or evidential, is the best argument against God, because it really is so very easy to get out of. It's just hard for someone whose God is a Mary Sue to deal with. It seems like there is some suffering and some evil that is just so atrocious that it doesn't seem like there could ever be a good point for it. Right. And this causes people then to say, given that, it seems like it's very probable that God doesn't exist. But we wouldn't want to come to that conclusion. Right. Why not? Why would we not want to come to the conclusion that is indicated by the evidence? As far as I can tell, this is basically just a straight-up admission that they are engaging in motivated reasoning rather than following the evidence objectively. They believe because they want to, not because it's where the evidence points to. But given this admission, it's weird that they have a show dedicated to presenting apologetics, which comes across as them pretending to be following the evidence without actually doing that. And um, number one, I would say, as Christians, we should remember we're make, we make a cumulative case for uh, the existence of God. In other words, God couldn't be arsed to give us just one thing that points conclusively to his existence. He just leaves hints scattered around that are supposed to point to the idea that maybe he exists if you interpret them correctly. So while we can talk about how, you know, the problem of suffering and evil or the problem of divine hiddenness, um, those can be difficult uh, for us to address Thankfully, I think that we have answers to all of that. Right. It'd be nice if you could, you know, give some of those answers instead of just repeating that they exist and moving on as if you've accomplished something. You still haven't even touched on any potential solution to the problem of natural evil. But I find that most apologists don't actually solve that one. They mention it at the beginning of their spiel out of necessity, and they hope that you lose track of what they're talking about long enough to think that they gave a solution to it somewhere, when really they almost always fail to address it farther than just pointing out that it's an undeniable problem that it exists. But when you start bringing in all of the positive evidence that we have for the existence of God, like the different arguments, like the cosmological, the teleological, some might even pull out the ontological, the different various moral arguments. Arguments are not evidence in and of themselves. They can be backed up by evidence, as the argument from evil is, and the fact that, you know, suffering is a thing that happens. But the arguments for God all lack the feature of testability. And can something be said to be evidence if you can't test it to see whether or not it actually fits with the argument? For all of the ones that he listed there, the best that could be said is that if we assume that their premises are actually correct, which we can't even demonstrate in the first place, then they point to a god. But I have yet to see an argument for god with premises that aren't based entirely on assumptions, and sometimes really bad ones at that. Sure, they may be logically valid, but logical validity means nothing when your premises are garbage. I think that we can concede that there is a lot of suffering and evil that we don't always know the point and the reason for. Nor do you know that there even is a reason. You just assume that there is a reason because otherwise that makes your god either an asshole or non-existent. Hell, even if there is a reason, the fact that he's all-powerful makes him still an asshole for not making his goal come about through less cruel means. But that doesn't mean that there's not a point. Right. No, and again, I would echo exactly what you're saying, that you you could then go to other lines of evidence, right? So this doesn't have to be your, your single argument and that's it, right? Deflection. That's called deflection, where you ignore a massive problem with your worldview and opt instead to shift focus to something that you think is more favorable to your position. Exactly. But I think one of the other things, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is it really goes back to how you're defining evil. So you can't have something like gratuitous or unjustified evil when an evil thing is a, a privation of the good. Okay, but what is the good? I know you think it's God's nature or whatever, but what does that even mean? You can't define your terms by comparing them to other undefined terms. Because you have to have the the good, right? You have to have God's nature, which is which is the root of the goodness, in order to be able to define anything exactly. as Exactly. No, you really don't. 
You don't need to have the hot to be the root of all hotness by which we measure cold, nor do we need the cold to be the root of all coldness by which we measure heat. And yes, I know that absolute zero is a thing, but I'm speaking in terms of human perception of hot and cold here. We don't step outside on a winter's day and determine that it's cold out by comparing it to absolute zero, we compare it to the temperature at which we are ourselves comfortable. And much as different people have different moral preferences, different people have different temperature preferences. My mother, for instance, keeps her house at 16 degrees Celsius, which I consider to be too chilly for a house. I keep mine at 21. Which of us is right? Does a comparison to absolute zero help us figure out which temperature is the correct temperature for a house? No, it does not. If anything, bringing absolute zero into the equation would make it harder to figure out because any temperature that a human is comfortable at is bloody hot when compared to absolute zero. And even though we all might have different preferred temperatures for our homes, meaning that the correct temperature at which to keep a room is subjective and based on preferences rather than objective, most of us can agree that certain temperatures are completely unsuitable. Nobody keeps their house at 5 degrees Celsius on purpose. That's too cold. And nobody sets their furnace to 35 degrees in the winter. That is far too hot. So somehow we manage to figure out that certain temperatures are the wrong ones for our homes, even though there isn't one objective temperature that is the ultimate temperature for a home. So you're assuming your definition, you're, you're, we're not agreeing on the definition of evil when you're making your argument, right? Well, no, we're not, but mostly that's because I've just had to guess at what your definition of evil even is since you haven't given it. Yeah. And I think that's problematic. How would you respond to something like that? Well, I think that what's interesting is you're really talking about kind of a standard here. Yeah. Like what is evil? if there's no such thing as the good. Remember earlier in this video when they made a point of explaining that evil is not a noun? Why are they now talking about good as though good is a noun and asking what evil is in the context of a noun if they know that evil is not a noun? Yeah. Right? And we as Christians would define God as the good what we're talking about objectively speaking so. Like you could subjectively say this is good uh, and if you don't, you know, attain to that, then that is bad. Right. But we're saying that as believers, that if there is a God who exists, mind independent of us, who created this world that is immensely powerful, all-knowing, loving, and those types of uh, attributes that we yeah. ascribe to God, uh, then we recognize that how does this fit in a world with so much suffering and evil. I really think these guys would benefit from having a more scripted dialogue. That sentence just went straight off the rails. You almost defined evil, but ended back at restating the problem of evil without quite getting there. A for effort, though. Yeah. Uh, and I think that we can say that there is explanations that God can have for why there's so much suffering and why there's so much pain and why there's so much evil that we can't understand this side of heaven. And there it is, the only way to tackle the problem of natural evil. Mysterious ways. Just trust that there's an explanation, even though there's no evidence for such an explanation. How fucking useless is that? But the atheist it wants to deny that God can't exist because of so much suffering and evil, uh, they also have to answer, well, um, what are they objectively comparing their standard of evil against? And I you answered that question yourself earlier in this video. Well-being. Minimize harm, maximize well-being. You didn't put it quite so concisely, so you're welcome, but you literally gave the explanation for how we can objectively measure evil out of your own mouth. The, the problem of, of suffering and evil, uh, our worldview as Christians explains it. Yeah. So, I mean, we live in a fallen world. This is his response to William Rowe's hypothetical story of a lightning strike causing a forest fire that results in a baby deer being severely burned to the point where it suffers terribly for several days and then dies. Adam sinned, and that's why there are forest fires, apparently. Somehow, eating the forbidden fruit caused tectonic activity, which causes earthquakes. I just don't see how that follows, like not even a little bit. An atheist has a tremendous amount of evidence on them to be able to say, well, I mean, you could just flip it like, okay, you want me to explain how in the world could there be a good God that would allow so much suffering and evil? Mm -hmm. Well, how can you guarantee that God doesn't exist just because there is suffering and evil? How is that flipping it? 
You guys are the ones claiming that God is all powerful and all loving. Suffering and evil just don't fit in with those characteristics, even when taking free will into account. But at least our worldview makes sense of it. Like on an atheistic worldview, there really are no values yeah. that natural selection thinks about. Right. It, it, natural selection is not concerned with categories of evil. What does natural selection have to do with this discussion? Why are you bringing natural selection up now? I mean, natural selection isn't concerned about what temperature it is either, but for the kind of life that developed on Earth, there are certain temperature ranges that work best for certain evolutionary strategies. The same could be said for morality. For a social species, there are certain aspects of morality that work better than others. Those are selected for. This is pretty basic stuff. The atheist has then the problem of good, right? So Absolutely. how are you defining anything as good? And how do you know what temperature to keep your house at without an absolute perfect room temperature that is best for everyone? And that's really all there is to it. They go into the emotional problem of evil from here, but there's really nothing to respond to there, and this video is long enough as it is. Today's comment of the day comes to us from everyone who keeps telling me to dial in my retraction settings for the 3D printed backgrounds. Yes, I know my settings could be better, but there's a couple things here. First is that the act of taking a stabilized time lapse will always result in little growths off of part of the print, as the print head moves away from the print in order to take a picture. It's a nuisance, but it'll never go away completely. Second, a lot of the time lapses I'm using are fairly old. They were taken more than a year ago when I had less practice than I do now. Third, each individual filament will have slightly different settings that work for it, and I don't have the time to precisely dial in exactly perfect settings for each individual filament that I use, and even the same filament that is different ages can make a big difference as the filament absorbs moisture over time and that changes how it prints. There are ways to mitigate that, but none of them are perfect. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, iOS Tilt Bill Gamer, Clen Eastwood, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, and all the rest, who are the absolute room temperature that allows my channel to be as hot as it is. If you'd like to be an ultimately useless comparison, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist. Links to social media, all the ways to support the channel, and to my other projects can be found at links.vicerhino.com. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!